What's up, people? Uh, for your at-home assignment today, just to kind of keep things moving a little bit, um, as we move into the next AOK, -okay, I wanted to make this quick video to give you an overview of the natural sciences um, as an area of knowledge and just talk about the knowledge framework because when we talk about um, areas of knowledge, we'll make sure that you're bringing in the actual aspects of the knowledge framework as specified within theory of knowledge. So like how is that knowledge developed and what are the key issues? The other thing is I kind of wrote this and then expanded upon it um, later on in class. And sorry, if this sounds weird, I had to pause because my wife wanted to come in the room and put like potatoes into the camera. I don't know. Anyway, um, if you want her to explain some natural science knowledge related to diploid potato breeding, uh, put something in the comments and let me know and she would be happy to make a video to discuss it and some of the issues of knowledge and development of knowledge and complications. Um, keep that in mind. But anyway, going back to this diagram here, so I just want to kind of do this just for purposes of the essay. Um, one thing is kind of how we're looking at this is more of an inductive process. So just kind of knowing what to do with the real life situation. So you have your prompt, from your prompt, you're developing your knowledge questions. Um, I said, I usually go by the rule of two, have two knowledge questions, have two real life situations with each knowledge question and use two areas of knowledge somewhere in your essay. So from there, you're gonna do your investigatory uh, real life situations. And I think one of the questions is like, what do we do with it at that point? And that's kind of, um, we're doing that like mini presentation activity in class and that's to kind of work on that. But we wanna to try to think about when we have our real life situation, what are the knowledge claims being made, which just means like, what are the conclusions that this article is drawing? Uh, sorry, this is a little bit off the screen. Uh, what ways of knowing apply to this real life situation and how is it representative of um, the knowledge question as a whole? Like how does that give us insight into the knowledge question based on what way of knowing is lending itself well to the real life situation? Always you can bring in perspectives and knowledge issues. So talking about things like um, bias or looking at the perspective of different areas of knowledge, which I actually have over here as well. You can bring in areas of knowledge as just its own thing, but thinking about, um, you know, just general um, perspectives in a discipline. So thinking about political perspectives or naturalist versus interpretivist perspectives, or thinking about um, if you want to go into science, you can, we're going to natural science, but talking about paradigm um, changes or paradigm shifts, scientific realism versus anti-realism. So anything you can do to kind of bring in perspectives or differing perspectives or knowledge issues related to this real life situation, whether it be reliability, correlation, causation, um, or cause and effect, I should say, or inference or things like that. And then obviously to get into that top tier, we wanna make sure that we're thinking about implications we can extract. So all of these things can be pulled from the real life situation. It does not mean that they need to be equal from the real life situation, but then after you've pulled out some of those analytical um, tidbits, you're gonna to want to make sure you apply it back to the knowledge question. Um, so talking about how it relates to your knowledge question, how it helps you answer your knowledge question, how it might even, I mean, I could also draw out, like out here going out this way, how you might even lead to further questions uh, for exploration, um, which you don't have to answer everything about this, but you can think about like, here's some questions that we're still having and, and developing. And then finally, maybe not within the same paragraph, but looking back at, at the end, what conclusions and implications do we have that relate us back to the prompt? Because we always want it to come back to the prompt. We need to make sure that we are making a stance or doing the or understanding the necessities and the requirements of the prompt. So I just wanted to go over that really quickly because um, I just I just kind of made it at the end of the day just to, to try to explain something to my third hour class. So if you're a team two, you probably already saw this because I probably will go through it anyway. Um, but yeah, so that's that. Um, so moving on, this is an overview and the knowledge framework of the natural sciences. So I had two big objectives I want you to take away from this. One of them is just going to be the first one, describe the scope, application, role of language, and methodology of the natural sciences is pretty much going to be right on these slides. Um, you just comprehend and um, kind of put them somewhere where you can remember them easily. And then the one that you're going to have to do a little bit of thinking is just comparing and contrasting the knowledge framework of natural sciences with that of human sciences. So we already did a little bit with human sciences, talked about the scope and applications, some of the concepts that are important in human sciences, looked at some examples of human sciences and some knowledge issues and talked about methodologies as well. Um, this right here 
this picture is a seashell fractal. So um, whenever I think about areas of knowledge coming together and starting with natural sciences, I always think of the fractal because the fractal is something that is empirically experienced in nature, but it follows um, a mathematical sequence, generally the Fibonacci sequence, and it develops something that is usually, for most people, aesthetically pleasing. Like there's something about having this, um, this ratio that develops mathematically within the empirical world that is pleasing to the eye. Um, so just thinking about even applying to arts, um, that these natural science um, aspects. So anyway, just throwing that one out there for you. This is what I usually think about. So what are natural sciences? We're talking about um, just in general, how they're defined in terms of IB theory of knowledge. So the textbook definition would be that it's the systematic, which means purposeful study of the natural world, and in some cases purposefully absent of human agency. So taking humans out of the equation, sometimes studying humans in terms of a life form, but not necessarily behaviors. So looking at the natural world, the things that can be experienced and seen in general, but we can have, if you're interested, a discussion regarding scientific realism and scientific anti-realism and how some schools of thought think that you should only focus on what can be directly observed and some schools of thought and sciences think that you can go beyond and kind of do more of an interpretation um, and look at things that aren't observed readily. So the overarching knowledge questions are actually the same as human sciences. We're always looking at how do we know things? What constitutes its true description of the world? Like how do we know what we're seeing is true or or, and how do we even define that? Like, is it a matter of it being shared enough and that means truth? Or is there like an objective reality that we're trying to look at? And then what are, why are things this way? So thinking about causation, it's very important in natural sciences. The big difference is of course going to be the subject matter. So the focus is gonna be more on the natural world and ourselves, not necessarily in terms of our behavior, but as biological species within the natural world. So you think about biology and studying humans, it's more from a uh, naturalistic perspective of you know the, the life cycle and the systems um, and how they relate to other life cycles and systems in the natural world. So here's like the big three in natural sciences. Uh, biology is the study of living systems or the study of life. It's a li the major life science. Chemistry is the study of composition properties of substances and matter. Um, so the actual composition of things that are occurring in the natural world. And then physics is the study of nature and properties of or a study of the nature and properties of matter and energy. So those are the three big ones. Uh, you could add in other ones like uh, geology, um, different types of earth science and like meteorological sciences. Um, not astrology, but astronomy. Um, yeah, so anyway, those are the big three though that you'll probably come across, across more, most often and have taken courses in uh, either now or at some point in your life. So here's the knowledge framework. I'm gonna start with the scope and application. So just make sure, I mean, you don't have to type down every single bullet point, just make sure you have an understanding in general of what the scope of natural sciences um, is and how it can be applied. So knowledge of the natural world is based mostly on um, observation and then using those observations to construct reason and imagination or, or using reason and imag imagination to construct those observations. So it's very, very important, like sense perception is gonna be a very important way of knowing just at the baseline of um, natural sciences, using reason to coherently go through um, those sense perceptions and then also imagination to kind of extrapolate out um, into more general um, premises and conclusions. So yeah, uh, at, at, at its ground level, we're talking about observation, much like in the human sciences, it's just the way that the methodology is conducted might be a little bit different, but in some ways uh, can be the same in terms of running experiments as well. So shared knowledge is extremely important. Many people would argue um, there's much more like what we call quote unquote cultural independence compared to other areas of knowledge, meaning that uh, culture, um, there's not as much difference across varying cultures in terms of how shared knowledge is developed and maintained in the natural sciences as there are in things like human sciences, religious knowledge systems, um, arts, uh, mathematics to an extent, and ethics. Um, prediction is often an important feature and that is one key like difference um, is that all natural sciences for, well I shouldn't use absolutist terms, but 
most natural sciences are going to be trying to make predictions about what is going to happen in the future or how things will behave uh, given variables. Whereas in the human sciences, there's a little bit of like back and forth of trying to explain why things got the way they were, like kind of looking back. And then some areas of human sciences looking more into um, what is uh, predictive, I guess. So like economics and sociology and political science try to be predictive. Um, but psychology and, and, and the other ones, political science, anthropology, tend, tend to be looking more at like why things are the way they are. Uh, generally producing generalized statements, principles, or scientific laws that are fortified through deduction. So deduction is important in all types of reasoning um, or areas of knowledge that involve reason, but deduction is going to be especially important, I guess, in, in um, natural sciences where one could argue that induction is a little more important than human sciences. And most laws that occur are causal. So looking at if A happens, then B will happen as a result. So a lot of independent and dependent um, variables in the methodology that they're going to be trying to develop conclusions related to. Um, concepts in language. So here's just a couple that I pulled out. So laws, like this, this concept of laws are typically stated using the language of mathematics. So a key thing that you've probably run into in your natural science classes is the importance of mathematics in explaining and communicating things. Um, and that's a key way that areas of knowledge work together, um, especially in physics, uh, chemistry. We think about things like stoichiometry um, and atomic weight. And in biology, when you're thinking about um, just independent and dependent variables in general and margins of error. Um, sorry, mathematics is going to be is going to be important. Uh, language is also necessarily precise in order to eliminate ambiguity. So the precision of the language is going to be very important. And there's usually like a collective shared knowledge system of language within various disciplines in the natural sciences um, that are used to communicate that are often different from what like public understandings of things are. And then finally, methodology. Uh, generally, the methodology is going to involve some kind of interaction with the natural world. Um, so that can be through an experiment or an observation. Generally, not going to be doing too many like surveys and interviews, um, you know, with like chemicals and atoms and things like that. But um, observing them in some way uh, using technology is going to be really important um, in the sciences, especially as we go forward. Models are very important, just like in human sciences. So developing predictive models of how things are working. Um, of how systems are working are, are very important. Classification and labeling, just like human sciences, but maybe not, it kind of pains me to kind of go out and say it, maybe, maybe not necessarily as tied to those labels as human sciences is, and that's just a hot take, to be honest. Um, I feel like in human sciences, the label is the label, and we need to keep the label. Um, whereas in natural sciences, maybe it's a little more fluid depending on the situation. Um, so classification, though, and patterns are a central idea. And then you've got this whole emphasis on the scientific method. So um, using a hypothesis and then using deduction and then induction or the use of reason and sense perception to kind of broaden out. So starting with a hypothesis and generalize, generally uh, working down to your conclusion and then using your conclusions you found to extrapolate out into other areas. So there's kind of this like hourglass kind of effect of general principles down into a conclusion, conclusion out into more principles, um, if that makes sense to you. Um, so though that's like the big knowledge framework, right? The scope and applications, the concept and language and the methodology. When you're talking about these in an essay, when you're using this er these areas of knowledge, you wanna make sure that you talk about something related to the knowledge framework. It's showing that you're not just kind of riffing on a discipline, you're actually like running it through a systematic way of thinking about knowledge itself within that discipline. So I can't stress that enough. That's probably where, because of our little like express way of doing this course this quarter, um, maybe has gone by the wayside or not been emphasized enough. And for that, I apologize, but just keep that in mind. Um, so I do have like a, a, a reflection question. So maybe just like pause me and like think about it. Um, you can also check out this amazing math answer right here, our physics answer, I think. Um, but how can knowledge developed in natural sciences support connect to, I already said support, sorry, or refute knowledge claims in other areas of knowledge? So obviously we already talked about the importance of mathematics. Um, I talked about the fractal with arts, but how do you see some of these other ones working together or possibly refuting each other? So taking time, just brainstorm, think of some ideas. We can talk about it in class a little bit. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next slide, but, but take some time to think about that.
Um, one of the big issues and complexities is language. I talked about how it's very important for the language to be precise. So this slide just shows various words and then kind of in the general public what they mean and then what the general scientific meaning is. And I ran this uh, through my uh, wife, the potato doctor, asked her some of these questions to see if she knew the scientific meaning. And it does check out for the most part. So um, things like um, positive feedback, for example, being very different. Um, positive trends. Um, uh, what was another one that was interesting? Oh, what an anomaly is. So thinking about anomalies as being, instead of being like a crazy abnormal occurrence, being a change from a long-term average, um, which is still kind of what it is, um, but just thinking about these things differently and, and the language and the precision of the language being very important. Um, this happens in the, in extent, to an extent in human sciences as well, um, but it is very, very important in the natural sciences. So anyway, here's my wife works on these. I gotta come and talk about the potatoes. But this is she works with diploid potatoes, which are, is a paradigm shift they would say from the conventional potato. If you want more information, again, you can request it. I'll have her make a video for you, or I can just tell you about it. Whatever you want. Um, anyway, so think about this. Maybe pause me again and just think about what do you think are some possible complexities or issues that uh, that one might deal with when developing knowledge in the natural sciences. All right, so here's some that I came up with, I think. Yep. All right, so first off, uh, we talk about this idea of scientific consensus. So for example, there's this thing like, uh, most people would use toothpaste when they brush their teeth and most people would brush their teeth. However, like for, like it's something like 80% of dentists actually say that toothpaste helps your teeth. So like how many peers must agree for a scientific consensus to actually occur? So when do you determine that you have a consensus? And then just to throw in some of the, that language of the prompt, how do you label a consensus and what does it mean? Um, or how does it relate to change in progress as well to have a consensus and then have someone deviate off and then maybe have a paradigm shift where you're developing something totally new. Um, speaking of shared knowledge, um, simplifying scientific knowledge for the general population can cause a lot of the complexity to be lost, especially because of the complexity of the language um, and the methodologies. So how do you publicize and get the, the um, general public to understand and be on board with shared with the shared knowledge that's being expressed um, while still getting rid of some of that complexity or maybe quote unquote dumbing it down as it were. Uh, since we put a lot of trust into scientists because of their expertise, especially in the medical field, uh, then when we do have inaccurate models, theories, and predictions, it tends to cause a lot of doubt. Like people think that they, they really put a lot of trust in these people and if you know, like I've studied science for any amount of time, you know that like they're constantly trying to falsify, falsify their uh, belief systems and look at things from different ways and they're gonna come up with different conclusions. But we tend to, as like a public, uh, emotionally maybe try kind of lose uh, trust or have a lot of doubt when we, um, when we see things are wrong or incorrect or changing. Issues of bias among experts in fields, um, in different fields, disagreements, uh, how, how does one school of thought um, win out uh, compared to another school of thought? So those are issues, with, um, knowledge issues in uh, natural sciences. Should knowledge in natural sciences determine merely what is or also what should be? So kind of moving into ethics. So generally, when we talk about looking at what is, we're talking about descriptive or sometimes it's called positive um, viewpoints or descriptions and moving into more normative or like setting the norm or looking at like what should be or what is ethical or moral. Um, so should, should natural science knowledge be used for that or should we just solely be looking at what is happening? Um, issues of ownership of knowledge and also funding. So who owns the knowledge? Um, does some knowledge not get released because of ownership issues? Should it be open to the public? Should you have to pay for this knowledge? Should people get paid for expressing this knowledge? So a lot of issues of ownership and, and how we look at ownership of ideas. And then uh, can the average person distinguish between science and pseudoscience? So what is science? What is something that's scientific? How do you make that definition? And then how do you distinguish it from something that's like fake science or pseudoscience? So those are my ideas of complexities within the natural sciences because often natural sciences gets a lot of trust placed into it. So thinking about how do we examine it critically um, is very important. And then finally, um, pseudoscience. So Karl Popper was a philosopher has idea of pseudoscience. 
And I'll kind of go through some common characteristics of pseudoscience, the list of the seven that are here. So something might be pseudoscience or like fake science or not scientific if it meets or some of these characteristics describe the research. So if the discover bypassed peer review to go directly to the media, it's probably a sign that it might be pseudoscientific. If they claim that the scientific establishment possibly as part of a larger conspiracy is trying to suppress their work, might be pseudoscientific. If the evidence is extremely hard to detect, they use very fine um, detection methods or their ability to explain effect sizes is very, very difficult, um, that might be an issue. Evidence takes the form of individualized observations or stories, which are difficult to generalize. So be, having anecdotal, only anecdotal evidence that isn't broadened out into a population, um, we're having a lot of issues with that with uh, COVID-19 right now and vaccines and treatments and talking about anecdotal um, evidence of things working versus having a broad population or a double blind experiment. Um, the discoverer claims that the knowledge is ancient, and hence more credible. Uh, that's, that's an exciting one. Yeah. Uh, the discoverer has worked alone by themselves. So again, the issue of personal knowledge versus shared knowledge. And then the discoverer needs to propose modifications to the laws of nature in order for their findings to be credible. So basically taking something we knew and completely changing it in order to fit this theory in. Um, paradigm shifts don't happen that often, um, and they're usually a pretty big deal when they do occur, and then eventually there's usually some shared knowledge around it. So if all of a sudden someone's proposing this giant paradigm shift, which we'll talk about the idea of paradigm shifts later, because that is important, um, that could be possibly pseudoscientific. This is the um, knowledge, some no general knowledge questions like I gave you of human sciences uh, related to um, natural sciences. So you can kind of take a look at those, but these are some things that maybe to be thinking about when you're using it as an area of knowledge. And then these are some examples of possible topics that maybe could be brought in just in general um, to your study of natural sciences. So I talk about Karl Popper and pseudoscience and falsification. Uh, that's an important one to look at specifically. The scientific method, obviously, paradigm shifts, which we'll talk about a little bit later, maybe issues of induction. So, so when is it appropriate to make a general conclusion from a specific example? All right, so hopefully that gives you just some background ideas of the knowledge framework and how to use it. Um, again, we want to go back to our objectives and thinking about can you describe that, especially from your own experience? Can you draw, can you draw upon experiences that you've had? And then on top of that, thinking about how does it compare and contrast with um, human sciences, you might find that they're actually quite a bit more similar than maybe you originally thought. All right. Otherwise, other than this, uh, have a good day and uh, let me know if you need anything, especially for essay task number two. Peace.